Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the TCS seminar series on contemporary issues in Asia, commemorating the tragedy of the 26th of November, Mumbai terror attacks. And within two hours, we will have uh, international seminars uh, to commemorate this event. As we know, on the night of November 26, uh, 2008, a group of armed terrorists from Pakistan attacked Mumbai city, the financial capital of India. The 10 terrorists who were trained by Pakistan-based terror group Lashkar-e-Taiba targeted several important locations simultaneously and mercilessly killed 165 people, including 140 Indian and 25 foreigners from 70 countries. My name is Asep Stiawan, lecturer uh, University of Muhammadiyah Jakarta, who like to, uh, to be a moderator of this seminar, international seminar. We do have uh, uh, four speakers, distinguished, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, as we know, the, the main purpose of this, this uh, seminar is to commemorate the tragedy of uh, uh, 13 years ago. And then we, we would like to discuss uh, and to unveil the full details of the terror attacks who behind it, and also raise awareness about the dangers of terrorism, terrorism and state sponsor terrorism. Basically, we do have, uh, uh, we will have a, a guest a speaker from India, uh, Lieutenant General uh, said retired, said Atta Hasnain, but uh, I think uh, uh, is not uh, yet present. So uh, for time being, I uh, would like to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker uh, because uh, Mr. Uh, said Atta Hasnain is not present yet. So we would like to uh, welcome Mr. Feramala Anjaya. Uh, please uh, allow me to share uh, the speakers, the first speaker of our uh, international seminar. Uh, Mr. Feramala is uh, quite uh, uh, my uh, he is my uh, colleague in the CSAS. and then uh, let me introduce uh, him first. Feramala Anjaya is a senior journalist and writer from Indonesia. He is currently working a senior research fellow at the Jakarta-based Center for Southeast Asia Studies (CSAS). And he has been working for Indonesian prestigious English daily, the Jakarta Post, for over 25 years. As the foreign desk editor of the Post, Anjaya wrote numer numerous articles on international affairs, including the South China Sea conflict. I think uh, quite long, but uh, basically, Anjaya is very active, even now, right in the Compassiana. And uh, he was. Uh, degree, MPL degree from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and master degree from University of Madras, uh, Madras, Chennai. So I would like to invite uh, first for the speakers, Mr. Paramala, but uh, fortunately we do have uh, uh, Mr. Atta. Uh, good afternoon. This good afternoon is, uh, to you, Mr. Sethiwan. I'm very so nice sorry I joined you. a little late. Yeah, no problem. We are very happy to see you here, uh, distant from New Delhi. So greeting from Indonesia, Mr. Atta. I would like to introduce you first uh, for the first speaker, even though the uh, I have already uh, mentioned about the Pak uh, Feramala, but uh, please allow me to introduce uh, a distinguished speaker. Uh, Lieutenant General retired said Atta Hasnain. Uh, welcome, Pa uh, said Atta Hasnain. Uh, I think uh, uh, you are is one Indonesia uh, India most decorated military officers. Uh, Mr. At, Mr. Uh, said Atta Hasnain received many awards, medals, including the Param Visit Seva Medal during his military career. He retired in 2013 as the military secretary after 40 years of service in the Indian Army Forces. Presently, he's working as the chancellor of the Central University of Kashmir. Prior to that, he had been specially inducted back to Srinagar to command 
the strategic 15 crops to restore order when the three year agitation in the street went out of order. In his long career, he has served in Sri Lanka with Indian peacekeeping force in Punjab during the heyday of militancy in India, Northeastern state and in seven tenures of duty in Jammu and Kashmir. He also commanded his unit in Siachen Glacier. Uh, he studied at Stephen College, New Delhi. He is an alumnus of the Asia Pacific Security Study Hawaii and the Royal College of Defense Studies London. He also studied at King's College University of London. So please welcome uh, Lieutenant General Itai Said Atta Hasnain to present your uh, presentation. Uh, do you want me to start in the beginning or are you get, uh, yes, going to introduce? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, you have uh, 20 minutes, please, sir. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, uh, my greetings uh, to the people of Indonesia. Uh, somehow, I just love your country. I've been there uh, two times in the last three years to Jakarta as a part of the Indian delegation uh, which was composed of uh, various diplomats, military personnel, other bureaucrats. Well, we were primarily on the panel for promotion of uh, India-Indonesia relations. And it was a great pleasure coming to Jakarta. Uh, a lot of people told me that Jakarta's traffic is the one thing which will going to be a big surprise to you. But uh, you'll be happy to know that Delhi's traffic is much worse than Jakarta. Right? So I was not at all. I was not at all disappointed in in, in Jakarta. I was very happy to be to be, to be there. Uh, right now, uh, today is a very important day in uh, India's calendar. Every year we we mark this particular day, 26th 11, 26th 11. Today is the 13th anniversary. In 2008, when this event occurred, let me first of all give you the brief facts about the event. It was a terrorist attack involving 10 terrorists who had to come by a very non-traditional kind of a route. They came by the sea. They came from a Pakistani territory, from Karachi. They came by the sea and they landed in uh, on the Mumbai shores and they distributed themselves into different targets in South Mumbai. Now, South Mumbai uh, is the district in which uh, most of the high-profile uh, hotels, the railway stations, a very good restaurants, shopping centers, hospitals, everything of this kind of institutions exist. And so this was a very well-selected target. This is one of the aspects you have to remember. Uh, 166 people were killed in this period. It started on the 26th of uh, November 2008. And it is only by 2000, by, it was only by 29th of November, that's almost 72 hours later, that uh, the uh, Indian security authorities finally announced that they had got total control and that they had eliminated nine terrorists and captured one alive. This is a very important uh, aspect, capturing one alive, because most of these, uh, these kind of terrorist attacks are suicide attacks, right? Where the terrorist comes to kill himself and be killed himself and kill as many people as possible. The aim of such attacks is always to draw attention, right? To draw attention to the capabilities of that organization. Uh, and uh, many times these are sponsored organizations. Most of these organizations of terrorists who do this are uh, non-state actors. They don't go to any, they don't, I mean, uh, they are not necessarily a part of a state apparatus. But many times the state informally supports them. So in this case, you call it a state-sponsored non-state actors. So these 10 of them were state-sponsored non-state actors who had come. One of them was captured alive. That is the most important aspect in it. Because normally in most attacks around the world, you will find um, the, the suicide attackers normally don't get captured. Now here, if you have captured one, it is easier to authenticate the whole chain of events which have taken place over a period of time by interrogation. Uh, all the waypoints, all the milestones to the, the perpetration of the particular act 
and it confirms who are the sponsors, which organization do they belong to. So this, uh, in this particular case, you had uh, Ajmal Kasab, uh, a 21-year-old boy, virtually I would call him, who was a part of this organization, uh, Lashkar e Taiba, and who was captured, and he, well, he blurted out everything to the uh, Indian security uh, organization. Um, the response, very briefly, the response of the Indian security forces, when it started from the lowest level, I can tell you one thing that I was um, at that time sitting in Kashmir. And this happened in the evening at about nine o'clock it started. And someone sent me a message on my mobile. Uh, my, my father happened to be living in Mumbai, not very far from this place where this attack was taking place. I had a house there itself. My wife was not there. She was away somewhere else. My, my father was living there alone. And someone asked me, I hope your father is safe. So I was wondering. I asked, I said, what has happened in Mumbai? They said, oh, put on your television. You'll see something. It's a gang warfare. Now, uh, Mumbai is very famous for gang warfare. So, you know, between smuggling gangs and things like that, criminal, criminal networks, essentially. So I switched on the television and I thought this is a gang warfare going on. I said, this is normal by tomorrow. It will finish in the morning. No, and I went to sleep. And I realized in the morning that this was nothing, no, not, not a gang warfare at all. It was a very, very big terrorist attack. And a number of institutions, uh, starting from Taj Mahal Hotel, which is one of the iconic hotels of the world, the Taj Mahal Hotel at the Gateway of India, uh, had been penetrated by two terrorists who had gone and shot a lot of people in the, look, in the restaurants at the ground floor. And then they had made their way to the higher um, upper reaches of the hotel, and no one knew where they were at that particular time. They had probably killed a couple of people. There was another hotel called the Trident Hotel, which is also sea-facing hotel, right on the sea face. Uh, they had two of them had penetrated there and uh, climbed up somewhere, and from there they were going up and up, up, upwards along the spiral of these staircases, um, uh, you know, firing at rat random. At random firing and opening locks and doors of various locked rooms. All this was happening. Uh, at the same time, two had gone to the railway station, not very far away. Uh, the Chhatrapati, Shivaji, Victoria Terminus, the old Victoria Terminus. There was a mayhem there. There were lots and lots of people waiting there uh, for trains. Normally in India, in Mumbai city, like Mumbai, you'll have a very large concentration of people uh, on the... On the uh, on the uh, railway station, even at the airport, you'll have a fair number of people. So, where airport has got a lot of security always, as you're aware. All airports have got that security. But railway stations somehow don't have that level of security. And so, these people could penetrate there and uh, a very, very large number of people uh, were killed at the railway station. And then from the railway station, the same people probably went into a hospital, which is just across the road. And uh, the hospital had no security because no one considers hospital as an area which uh, could be struck. And lots and lots of patients, doctors, etc., got affected by this. And lots of people lost their lives. Then, of course, uh, there were one or two very high-profile restaurants into which they penetrated. And uh, last of all, besides other some other places, last of all, into a small Jewish institution. Now, these were Muslims. I am a Muslim. Many of you are Muslims, but none of us believe in this kind of a thing. But here were some very radicalized extremist Muslims following Islam who had come in, who had sponsored, and obviously for them to strike a Jewish institution, right? It was for them a very iconic kind of an achievement. Uh, they went in and they actually killed the parents of a very young child, just about two years old or so. Now he's grown up. 15 year old boy and uh, he was uh, uh, protected by his by his nanny an indian nanny uh, this was a very very unfortunate thing which had happened it went all, all over the world on television um, uh, screens everywhere people empathized a lot with the family uh, i must also say that um, this was the first time that you found that approximately 25 foreign nationals were targeted and these people were mostly those who were dining in the local, in the, in the restaurants at the Taj Mahal Hotel, 
at the Oberoi Hotel and at a very high profile uh, restaurant very close to the Taj Hotel, where well, called Leopold. And uh, that's uh, where they targeted many foreigners there also. So about 25 foreigners overall were killed out of the 166. The total number of people who were injured was approximately 300. So now this is the broad description. Uh, at the end of it, eight, day, eight of them, nine of them were killed, one of them one was captured. In terms of response, we had the response from the lowest to the highest level. Local police, supported by army subsequently, well, there's some, some army some, uh, deployed in Mumbai, they came in. And then the specialized troops, you know, there were also some um, special forces from the Navy which came in. And then uh, the force was flown in from Delhi, the National Security Guard, which is whose responsibility, uh, anti-terrorist anti -terrorist squads are normally with them, they came in. Now, one of the major lessons of this uh, is, is from this particular point. The National Security Guard could only reach by next morning by 10 o'clock or so in the morning because their route, on the route in Delhi itself to get to the airport, they got blocked by traffic. This is why we were talking about traffic just now in, in Jakarta and in Delhi and Delhi's terrible traffic uh, blocked the route and they were delayed for very long. Then when they reached the airport, the aircraft which they were supposed to be getting was not there. They are not touched up. So obviously, in these kind of situ emergent situations, one of the major lessons learned is that you must have your special forces, your anti-terror squads, deployed all over the country. Now we have done that. We have got hubs, what are called anti-terrorist hubs, uh, created in Mumbai, in Bangalore, in, um, in Calcutta, in Chennai, and places like that. The second thing is, there should be a law, which has now been done, of course, there should be a law that any aircraft, any commercial aircraft, a national commercial aircraft, should be immediately requisitioned and made available to the anti-terror forces. You don't have to wait for the air force to fetch up. You don't have to wait for a particular type of aircraft to fetch up. The quickest thing, the earliest thing you get, you should be made available and get to get to this the place like they got to Mumbai. Now, in Mumbai itself, from the airport to South Mumbai is quite a distance, and there is fair amount of traffic. Once again, to reach there. It was a bit of a challenge, but but uh, helicopters were provided, and so many of the many of the special forces mounted these helicopters and came immediately to South Mumbai, and the operation could only start around about ten o'clock. One of the other major lessons in this was that uh, most hotels, you see, 2008, uh, mostly in India, our experience of terrorist attacks had been the placement of uh, improvised explosive devices in trains, in buses at um, bus stops uh, and places like that. So when they blow up, a large number of people die with it. A physical suicide terrorist attack had not taken place here, at least in the mainland India. In Jammu and Kashmir, it had taken place in other places also, but not in places like Mumbai and Delhi and places, in Mumbai or places like that. So what happened was that uh, Everyone was expecting, uh, no, no one really expected that there will be intervention operation. Now, these operations are called intervention operations. When a special forces squad comes, a terrorist squad comes, anti terrorist squad comes. The, the first thing that they want to know is if, if, the, if a hotel or, if a, of a, or a, a hospital, if it has been the target and the terrorists are still holed up there, then it is very important that you must know the layout of that hotel. So most place times, why should anyone keep uh, readily available the full site plan of a hotel? But now it is a necessity, we know, that site plans of hotels must be made available, should be available immediately. So that when the, when the anti-terror squads come in, they are presented to them, perhaps they have already studied them to some extent before. These need not be available on Google and things like that, but they should be available in hard form. So that immediately the squads can study them and know which are the places affected, how, what kind of access they can make to them, what is the best methodology of planning. That planning can only be based on the maps and the, and the diagrams of the hotels, the, the hospitals, etc. So that's a very, very important lesson that we also learned. Besides that, uh, we also learned one of the things that while our police force was very, very brave, local people very brave, uh, they did not hesitate in carrying out operations, waiting for the army, waiting for the 
national security got to come. But in most cases, you find, I'm not sure whether it's so in Indonesia, but uh, you know, the priority given to police forces in terms of their equipment and things like that is generally lower. So the quality of weaponry, quality of training given to personnel of the Mumbai police was much, much lower than that of the National Security Guard and places like that. Today, we have been able to arm them with better weapons. Otherwise, for example, to have an old 303 rifle of the Second World War against an AK-47 rifle, it, it's, it's a very, very awkward comparison. So, so this is another thing. We need to have comparative, comparative arming of the local police so that they have a good chance against the terrorists right in the beginning when the first set bit of response comes in. Okay. Uh, besides this, I thought uh, I must give you the geopol basic geopolitics of this entire thing. Before I come to the geopolitics, one final word on the, on the aspect of the the plan as such is important. The, this act was perpetrated by a, a Pakistani terror group called the lashkar e taiba It started its operations way back in the late 80s. By 1996, it was entering into, it had entered into Jammu and Kashmir and was very proficient in its operations in Jammu and Kashmir. Now it had moved out of the, out of the ambit of Jammu and Kashmir, selected 10 men, they gave specialized training, particularly in swimming, in explosives, in the use of coded language, in the use of radio, and things like that. And uh, this training was given for a fairly long time, well away, well away in the in a mountainous area in Baluchistan somewhere. And they were brought to Karachi. They were taken in a in a boat uh, to the high seas, and there they captured an Indian an Indian trawler. Indian fishing trawler, right? Uh, you know, to make sure that you don't leave behind a trail behind. So they came and captured this uh, this uh, trawler, killed all the four uh, the Indian personnel who were on the trawler, and brought this trawler up to a certain point, uh, a little ahead beyond Mumbai. And from there, they got into dinghies, two dinghies. Dinghies are these rubberized boats, inflated boats which give a very small uh, radar footprint. And uh, with that and outboard motors, from there they made their way to Mumbai and they landed in South Mumbai near a beach. Now, they were not probably very certain. Their reconnaissance had already been done by satellite. Of course, today by Google, it's very easy to do reconnaissance uh, of any area. But one of their earlier personnel, a man called David Headley, who was a Pakistani US citizen, he had come to Delhi. He had come to Mumbai. He had been given about thirty or forty thousand dollars. Stay here for some time and carry out a reconnaissance of all the sites and that, so that they could finalize where all they will attack. This is exactly what they did. They, they, uh, uh, Headley went and gave them the full report, and according to that, they chose these targets, which are going to make a very, very major, you know, impact, uh, not only within India but impact into the uh, on on the whole world. Uh, before coming to geopolitics, one other important thing, why did they choose Mumbai? That's one of the questions you have also asked in your concept paper. Why did they choose Mumbai? You see, Mumbai is India's financial capital. Like Delhi is India's political capital. Mumbai is India's financial capital. Mumbai is on the coast. It's got a very big port and harbor, right? And uh, much of India's trade goes out from the Mumbai port. Uh, we've got uh, lots of other naval facilities, merchant shipping facilities in this place. And that makes it the financial hub. So most of the big financial institutions of India are located here. The Reserve Bank of India is located here. The headquarters of the State Bank of India is located here. Now, one of the major issues involved in this was how to make an impact in such a way that India's financial capital gets impacted, the confidence of the people gets impacted, the administrators, uh, their sense of uh, administration gets paralyzed, and to a very great extent, the, 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 the inward investment which is coming into India, the foreign direct investment coming to India, FDI, gets affected. Who would want to go to a city and invest if it is the target of terrorists? I need to remind you, 
2008 was not the first terrorist attack. We had uh, Mumbai under continuous terrorist attacks from 1992, 93 in fact, from 1993, continuously. Very large number of people had died, 2001, 2005, 2007, and now 2008. So there, there had been large number of terrorist attacks in, in Mumbai. Uh, the primary reason why the terrorists found it so convenient was because they felt that it would make a very, very major impact. We had one major terrorist attack in Mumbai, was Mumbai uh, sorry, in Delhi. Delhi has also had many terrorist attacks. But one of the most impactful attacks in Delhi was the attack on, on India's parliament. And that was a very unfortunate thing, 13th of December 2001, that this attack took place by six uh, uh, terrorists, uh, this time of a different organization called the jaish e mohammed also from Pakistan. So that brings me to the geopolitics. And I'm speaking to a very intellectual uh, set of uh, uh, people here. I'm, uh, I'm sure you will appreciate uh, this aspect. India and Pakistan are not the best of friends, right? Uh, we have got... We are a country of 1.3 billion. Pakistan is a country of 200 million. Pakistan is, is a Muslim nation, is an Islamic nation, declared Islamic nation. Okay. India is a secular nation. We are a democratic, secular nation, which means out of the 13, uh, 1.3 billion people, we also have more than 200 million Muslims. Now, the, on, the, on the scale, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation. Although I fully understand that it's not. Indonesia is virtually secular in that, in that manner. I know what kind of a syncretic culture uh, Indonesia has got and how it respects uh, diversity um, and other cultures and things like that. Excuse me, um, five, five, five minutes more, please. Okay, yes, five minutes. Thank you. And I fully, uh, you, you have to appreciate that India is a similar nation like uh, Indonesia. Okay. We also have diversity. In fact, we have even more diversity. And we are a much, much larger nation. Uh, you are, uh, to my to my estimates and knowledge, 2.2, 2.2 uh, million, uh, 222 million uh, population, generally Islamic population. We have 200 million Muslims in, in India too, right? So we have actually more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. We are the, almost the second largest nation after Indonesia, second largest Muslim country within any, any country. This, is, this happened in 1947 because of the partition there. And uh, we have had a lot of problem over Kashmir. This is a territory not in the north, which uh, uh, Pakistan claims to be its own because it is Muslim majority. But we believe very clearly that uh, there is no religion involved in this. Uh, we feel that this this area which was under a Hindu Maharaja uh, actually belongs to India. And uh, that's why this, for the last 75 years, this problem has been going on in Kashmir. And it's Kashmir which is at the heart of this issue with the Pakistan, right? Uh, since 1989, we have had a, a huge campaign being fought by Pakistan against us in Jammu and Kashmir. It has brought us close to war many times, 1999 in particular. Even after 2000, uh, this nine, after after 2011, we almost went to war. Uh, once again, after that, it's, it's happened a couple of times. So uh, this is a trigger. It's it's, a, it's always a trigger. Pakistan is ruled through two organizations. One is the organization which is the official government of Pakistan. The second is what we call the deep state. The deep state is within Pakistan. The unauthorized people who rule. This is the army itself, members of the intelligence agency, many veteran soldiers, veteran officers, senior officers, lots of religious clerics, etc., who rule Pakistan. And they always feel that uh, they need to target it. One of the prime reasons for it is because in 1971, they lost the war against India. And that is how Bangladesh got created. And Bangladesh is a huge Islamic nation or two. So uh, Pakistan has always felt that it was India responsible for this and they must get back against it. Now they are fighting this so-called fourth generation of war against us by striking at all places in Jammu and Kashmir in different ways. And they keep trying to do it in the rest of India, everywhere. 2611 Mumbai uh, terror attacks was a part of this setup, this whole sequence of actions which have been taking place over a period of time 
to keep India committed, to keep uh, to create communal problems in India between the Hindus and the Muslims, etc. Fortunately for us, it's, these problems are have not taken place to the extent that the Pakistanis would have desired that they, that they take place. My last point. Uh, can there be a can there be a Mumbai attack again? I always say that yes, you should learn your lessons from such some such acts and some of the lessons I've brought out for you. But uh, terrorism is the most unpredictable phenomenon. The same action will not be repeated normally. Something completely fresh will happen. For example, in today's world, we are seeing in Europe a lone wolf attacks taking place. Right? That's a single man. With a way, you don't even have to have an explosive. You don't even have to have a rifle or a gun. All you need is a big vehicle or even a small vehicle, and you have a collection of people somewhere, and you ram your vehicle into that and kill 50, 60 people. Now, these are the kind of terrorist acts you can expect. You have seen uh, the within Pakistan, you have seen how badly Pakistan itself got affected by terrorists within Pakistan. Um, they, they attacked the Peshawar public, uh, Army Public School. 139 people, children were killed. Now, that kind of a thing can happen in India too, because you've got thousands of schools all over. How much? Can, how many schools can you give security or protection for? Or any other institution of this kind, hotels, clubhouses, right? These are the kind of places which can be targeted anytime. What you have to ensure is that your response mechanism is strong enough to minimize the damage and the losses. And your intelligence organizations are sharpened up enough to be able to get you early warning on base on which you can carry out an early response. Thank you very much. I will stop. Thank you very much again. Uh, Lieutenant General Itaid said at the has nine. I think uh, you have already explained in details and comprehensively, briefly, but uh, I learned that you have uh, emphasized uh, the analysis from the political views and military to some extent, because your background is uh, heavy, is military, and very, very interesting explaining when you, you compare the weapons, for example, how, how sophisticated the, the attackers uh, compared to the local police. And also you emphasize of uh, why the Mumbai uh, becoming uh, the target attack. Uh, you put uh, geop uh, geopolitical term in this attack and how we're uh, uh, supposed to be, you know, have a, a shocking effect in India itself because this is a financial center of uh, the country. Uh, I would like to uh, say hello to Feramala and we, we, we will have uh, three more speaker, Feramala Anjaya, the next speaker, but I would like to introduce yourself. And I would like to also to introduce to the audience, uh, Mr. Ahmad Kisai, uh, lecturer of uh, University of Paramadina. And uh, he is an alumni of India, I guess, uh, Mr. Ahmad Kisai. So, uh, Mr. Sedata uh, would understand. Uh, and then uh, also Mr. Anton Ali Abbas will be the last speaker. And he is a, a Cranfield University alumni. So UK alumni, as you, Mr. Sedata has nine, <laughs> as me also, UK alumni. So please uh, welcome uh, Mr. Feramala. I would like to uh, uh, give a little bit uh, information about the next speaker, even though I just uh, explained uh, uh, quite uh, ex uh, long about uh, Feramala and Jaya. Uh, so basically, I, 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 I don't want to read all of detail, but uh, Feramala and Jaya indeed is a senior journalist in Indonesia uh, because uh, your experience in Jakarta Post for over 25 years. And also uh, Mr. Feramala is uh, also a researcher uh, TCS and uh, alumni of uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, New Delhi, and also master degree from University of Mad uh, Madras, Chennai. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Feramala, to present your um, papers uh, in this uh, seminar. Please, uh, time is yours. Uh, would you mind to unmute first uh, for your speaker yeah, yeah. and microphone, please? Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rasep. Uh, my dear uh, uh, fellow distinguished speakers, 
a very good afternoon uh, today is a very black day in india because india and indonesia are on the same boat we are facing uh, the problem of terrorism like uh, mumbai attacks what happened uh, on 26 november 2008 on uh, in indonesia also 2002 we had a terrible bali bombings so in which say, the, the, the pattern is the same but only the difference is uh, the perpetrators in bali bombings were indonesians but uh, the perpetrators in this mumbai uh, uh, terror attacks were foreigners not indians so first slide please yeah i am going to speak about why did pakistani terrorists target mumbai so that is that just now uh, 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 let Ge lieutenant general mr atta asnain uh, already explained uh, but i will go into further details uh, uh, please uh, next slide please yeah so uh, there there were a total 10 terrorists they were trained uh, in pakistan and they came illegally to mumbai city and they entered and they launched attacks at uh, five major locations and similar other locations so there were almost 400 uh, people were affected uh, 166 people were killed and more than 300 people were injured next slide please yeah so actually in this attack uh we have ordinary people we have indians we have foreigners i think uh, there are there were 26 foreigners from 16 countries were killed and we had also uh, 20 security forces including the national security guard police and other people were also killed so uh, these uh, 10 people uh, who came from uh, pakistan and uh, with, with their uh, uh, towns cities are there Uh, next slide please yeah actually uh, it is uh, this uh, terror attack was planned long time to launch this uh, uh, attack uh, attacks which uh, were very precious uh, 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 the, uh, what you call uh, uh, thought, uh, complete perfect manner they launched these attacks how can how did they do it because actually they picked up 32 persons first and they uh, they trained them uh, in uh, four locations one is uh, murdai monshera muzaffarabad and uh, karachi all were in pakistan and then they selected 13 uh, terrorists uh, then uh, out of the 13 uh, six uh, people were sent to kashmir to launch terror attacks there Uh, so now they had they had seven so now three people more joined uh, this uh, batch and now it became a 10 uh, so actually they were during the training i think uh, according to the confessions of the terrorists they were trained by the uh, both active and retired officers from the pakistan army as well as inter services intelligence the spy agency and uh, the lashkari toiba commanders they were trained next slide please Uh, so uh, they during the training they didn't tell where they are going to attack so then uh, only in the mid september they uh, briefed them that your target is mumbai and uh, this is the plan and everything they explained they departed uh, karachi from november uh, uh, on november 22 and then they hijacked uh, as a mr uh, 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 our lieutenant general said that uh, uh they kidnapped a fishing boat called mv cooper and they killed all the five crew members and then from there they traveled on that fishing trail so that nobody can detect them and they entered the mumbai on a uh, 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 what do you call a, a rubber boat uh, then they started uh, uh, attacks uh, they split into five groups two each Uh, and uh, they only the, the the two terrorists who tried to attack uh, leopard uh, cafe uh, after their attack they have to go back to the taj hotel so they will continue the attacks so i am not going into the details because we already heard uh, from the previous speaker 
Uh, so in this uh, mess, I mean, they didn't uh, what you call uh, discriminate because their mission was mainly one thing: you kill as many people as possible and you die. So this was the mission, and they, these people uh, were brainwashed by this Lashkari Toiba religious leaders, and they agreed to die. So that was the uh, most difficult uh, part. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. Next slide, please. These are all the attacks. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. This is the my main focus of the uh, 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 my topic uh, because uh, why. Pakistani terrorists uh, targeted Mumbai because Mumbai, uh, Mumbai is not in a disputed or a conflict zone like Jammu and Kashmir, but uh, uh, it is far away from Jammu and Kashmir and uh, from the Pakistani border. Why did they choose this? Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Mumbai, as rightly said by my my previous speaker, Mumbai is the financial, commercial, and entertainment capital of India. So it is it, it is the capital of three: financial, commercial, and entertainment capital of uh, India. It is it is perhaps most crowded city. I think it is the seventh largest, most populous city in the world. Seventh in India, it is the second after Delhi. Uh, so uh, then. Even if you see uh, why they chose the, that uh, railway station, Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus uh, railway station, in that railway station every day, can you imagine, 3.5 million people use that railway station, pass through that, 3.5 million on a single day. So that's why they want to kill as many people as possible there. Uh, then uh, we had uh, uh, this Mumbai contributes 6.16% of India's GDP and also 70% uh, of India's trade. Uh, then 70% uh, of all financial transactions in India. Then the city has also uh, home to 28 billionaires and 46,000 millionaires. Actually, the G uh, Mumbai GDP is almost uh, equivalent to Indonesia's because uh, it has something like 900 billion dollars of GDP. Can you imagine? So it is, it is really a financial capital. So these terrorists, uh, uh, it was not the first time they targeted Mumbai. Earlier also they targeted, they instigated religious riots in 1992. And in 1993, they uh, uh, launched coordinated bombings which uh, killed 257 people. And also in uh, on July 11, 2006, uh, Mumbai train blast, uh, train blast killed 2009. Uh, and even after this Mumbai attacks also, they attacked again in Mumbai, they killed 26 people. But out of these all terror attacks, uh, this Lashkar uh, Toba uh, took part in the, the Mumbai train blast. So that's why they, uh, that was maybe the one of the reasons they targeted this railway station also because they knew that uh, the casualties will be in a high number. Uh, so this is the only terror incident which was recorded live and also abundant of evidence because in the beginning, Pakistan tried to claim that these terrorists were not belong to Pakistan. It took 42 days to admit that the terrorists were Pakistanis. Actually, the, uh, it was also very uh, rare that the, one of the terrorists was uh, caught live. So he gave full details. And later on, we had another, uh, that uh, uh, David Hadley, who, who is a Pakistani American, whose mother was an American and uh, whose father was a Pakistani diplomat. So he has physical features of like a real American. So that's why he was able to easily, he changed his name from a Pakistani name to a Christian, uh, looks like a Christian name, David uh, uh, Headley. 
so he visited mumbai to uh, document to film everything so next slide please ah uh, who who were behind this uh, lashkari toiba it was established by hafiz sahib this gentleman and uh, he had a 5 million dollar uh, reward uh, on his head by the us government and he has also uh, a, 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 a what you call a charity as well as political organization called jamaish uddawa and uh, it is also very close to to the al qaeda this hafiz sahid has a very good relations uh, uh, with uh, osama bin laden but actually according to some uh, reports that he was the uh, first uh, 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 sorry the the osama bin laden's house in abbottabad in pakistan was actually built a land belonging to the lashkari toiba his group so you can imagine so they, they, he was acting very closely so they, this organization is the most uh, what you call we can say uh, uh, sound organization in terms of money they have 5 million dollars for only to spend on the terrorist training and launch attacks next slide please ah uh, so the motive behind the attacks of course the the, the uh mumbai is the financial capital that was the main uh, motive but actually why they did choose this attack uh, uh because uh, at that time in 2008 uh, 2007 there was a lot of uh, dissatisfaction among the uh, lashkari toiba uh, uh, mostly young young cadres uh, so these lashkari toiba and the isi want to uh, provide some inspiration to these young uh, cadres because otherwise the, the the those young cadres wanted to separate from lashkari toiba they want to establish their own group because this lashkari toiba leadership was very close to the pakistan army and the isi uh, then uh, then another part is it was also a part of uh, pakistan's proxy war against india next slide please uh, so uh, when these attacks occurred uh, we have to appreciate the us and the uk uh, they did a, a very good diplomacy not to retaliate against pakistan so the india stayed calm uh, they were successful but they put a lot of pressure on pakistan pakistan even pakistan uh, uh, prime minister foreign minister they condemned these attacks and they promised that they will uh, uh, prosecute uh, the mastermind but despite this clear, uh, clear evidence testimonies from three people pakistan refuses to pro prosecute terrorists for their crimes against humanity they always delay and uh, they use all means uh, not to punish these uh, masterminds uh, so even uh, i think uh, at the highest level the former prime minister nawaz sharif openly uh, admitted to the journalists that pakistan was involved in the mumbai uh, terrorist attacks so now uh, for example uh, this uh, lashkari toiba leader he is serving a jail sentence now because uh, pakistan was put under the uh, fatf uh, grey list i think uh, our uh, fellow speaker ahmed kisai will throw more light on uh, uh, on the uh, fatf's uh, uh, grey list uh, so he was supposed to be in the jail but recently some of his enemies they uh, attacked uh, uh, on his home in lahore how come it possible a person who is serving a jail sentence he was staying at home and that was known to his enemies so it so it is just a big drama uh, arresting and uh, releasing on bail and uh, everybody so there is no sincerity next uh, uh, slide please yeah so this is uh, my conclusion uh the big powers did prevented the war between india and pakistan but the victims of this 2611 mumbai mumbai terror attacks have not received justice i mean we in indonesia may uh, say oh, oh it is happened there no actually our neighbors singapore malaysia thailand they also had victims in these attacks 
three ladies, I think one lady from Singapore, one lady from Malaysia, one lady from Thailand were also killed. Mercilessly, these terrorists killed. So the maybe uh, the international community must put pressure on Pakistan to sponsor, uh, stop uh, sponsoring terrorism. A responsible state should not sponsor or support these terrorists. But uh, Pakistan is doing so that is a very uh, bad. Uh, countries should remain on alert to prevent similar attacks in the future. There is a, uh, a, a big scope, like uh, my previous speaker mentioned, that it may be possible in the future because these terrorists are uh, like uh, they are very crazy. They want to kill as many people as and they want to die. So that, that, that was an insane act. So that's why uh, uh, even our uh, president, uh, uh, Joko Vidodo, uh, said these terrorists do not belong to any religion. They love violence. They want to kill people. So it is, that's why uh, all the governments uh, in the world must take stern actions uh, to uh, curb this terrorism. Of course, the terrorism comes from the radicalism. So that's why it is very dangerous uh, uh, if we have more radicals in the country. So uh, right now, Indonesia is also taking uh, uh, possible actions. Uh, the, it is, is uh, focusing on the people who are, uh, who are providing funds, who are providing weapons, who are providing uh, support to these uh, people. So that's why uh, uh, the government uh, recently arrested some people for uh, uh, with the suspicion that these people are raising funds in the name of charity. Like it's same thing Lashkari Toiba and uh, JU Day are doing in Pakistan. They are a, on front, they are a charity organization, but behind they involve in terror, uh, terror activities. So these are the things uh, I think we must remember. We must all unite to fight against this terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for Ramala Anjaya for the explanation of the event, the terrorist attack uh, 13 years ago. My understanding that you have uh, give a three level analysis in the same time, individual levels uh, who are responsible for the attacks. And uh, you mentioned also group level of analysis, who the groups involved, so the attacks. And even you mentioned about the state level analysis you yeah. mentioned about the state uh, which uh, suspected uh, uh, and indeed proven maybe uh, as peramala and jaya involves in this uh, attack uh, uh, before we continue for the, the speaker uh, uh, for uh, for the commentation uh, i would like to have a photograph first, uh, so uh, please uh, have a, a very good and smile uh, face <laughs> uh, please uh, go ahead uh, the committed to take the picture uh, because this is very important for the documentation. Okay, let's continue our discussion. The next speaker is Mr. Ahmad Kisai. So please uh, give me time to introduce uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, Pak Ahmad uh, Kisai is uh, born in Blitar, is Java, Indonesia. He holds a PhD in political science from Aligarh Muslim University in India. His academic interests are on civil society and democracy, Islam and identity politics, international, polit international relations, Indian politics and economy, sustainable development and governance. Apart from being an assistant professor in Paramadina Graduate School of Diplomacy in University of Paramadina, he worked as a program director until May 2020. So recently he has moved to next uh, non-government organization uh, the partnership uh, for uh, governance reform. So, uh, Mr. Um, Atahasnain, so he is uh, alumni of uh, India. So, welcome, Ahmad Kisai. Please, uh, time is used for uh, presentation. 20 minutes, please. Thank you, Kang Asep. Uh, I've called you Kang Asep, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's a Remembrance Day uh, today, as mentioned by uh, 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 said uh, Hassan Ainsab earlier. Uh, this is a tragic day for India. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, if I recall the situation, I was I was back in 2008. I was in the office and I heard about this this 
uh, news I thought it is. I think it's, it's normal, I'm so called normal in the sense like uh, throughout my 10 years in India, I, 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 I experienced you know, the threat and, and situation like terror attack, but then uh, suddenly things evolving uh, just uh, beyond my imagination at the time. And also, one of the things that wasn't mentioned earlier in this uh, discussion about the role of media, actually, because the uh, there was incidences where you know those who are, were in in a safe place were then interviewed and all and uh, watching TV and all then uh, by the media and that's all. You know, sometimes when we are in a such situation, sometimes we just lost uh, uh, consciousness um, or conscience of, of what we should do and and everything. So. Uh, for me, uh, uh, consciousness is one. Uh, the last time I was in Mumbai was in 2006, so it was just a very, you know, very uh, shocking moment when it, it gradually revealed, you know, you know, the victims and everything. Uh, it's been explained a lot by the two speakers earlier, so I will not, you know, uh, repeat all those things. But I was, I will, I will just touch upon aspects that uh, sometimes is of sometimes overlooked, uh, sometimes. Uh, not really uh, being considered very, very, very critical, but then it's actually this very, very critical from my point of view. It is about money, you know. Everyone loves money, and everything uh, is 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 uh, valued according to money. For example, just like I explained earlier, Mumbai is the, the financial capital. So through money, through uh, financial uh, strength, these uh, you know inhuman attack to humanity actually. Occurred. So I'll bring a discussion uh, on the aspects of terrorism financing and how and what we can do about it. So in the first slide, uh, I will bring a little bit uh, about the, what is, could you move into the second the first uh, slide, please? Next slide, yeah. I will start by... Uh, Discussing a little bit about you know, illicit financial flow. When you talk when you talk about illicit financial flow, it's it's, it's something about you know uh, money that is illegally uh, transferred or used across borders. So this this is something uh, it's, I, I can say is the general uh, definition of illicit financial flow. There is no exact uh, definition of it, but then this is this is something that is. Uh, accepted as, as, as the definition. Where it comes, it usually comes from you know, legal or illegal uh, uh, sources, but mostly it's illegal and then being used to something which looks legal. So, and the value, if you look at this uh, uh, study by Global Financial Integrity, is about 20% of the value of total trade from developing countries to advanced countries is the value, the total value of uh, the, uh, uh, the illicit funds of all. And if we go by what the uh, study in, uh, you know, by the uh, uh, UN, UNCTAD, then we see that 88 you know, billion dollars, it's not rupiah, not rupee, but it's billion dollars actually, uh, flew out of, of Africa. In one of the study in Indonesia, uh, one of colleagues from uh, Prakarsa, uh, the Prakarsa uh, uh, Institute, or, or yeah, they, 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 they tried to measure the inflow and outflow of this fund flow in Indonesia. It's hovering around you know, a gigantic number of 60 to 40 million, billion, million do, billion dollars that, that goes in and out of Indonesia. It's, it's very, very, you know, uh, 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 terrible, I can say, because the impact is so much that uh, the agreement on global uh, agenda called Sustainable Development Goals put it as one of the important targets, 16.4, that those illicit money should be reduced or should be eradicated by 2030. I know it's a huge call, but then it's very, very, very difficult task to to uh, to do because it needs uh, not only two to tango, but uh, for our and us to actually join in and, and push and, and and work together. As an example, you know, like these are the final flow. I mentioned one, two, three, four. I just focus on the last one that, that you know, uh, apart from those uh, so-called laundering, uh, there's also 
uh, this uh, illicit fine of law also, also occur when you know member of a terrorist actually uh, use the money to to uh, uh, finance activism uh, the, the terrorist activism mentioned in the uh, concept note of this uh, program David Haley was also uh, given money you know, quite some of it if we com uh, convert it to rupees so it's a huge amount of money lack of money <laughs> I forgot the, the counting it but then uh, lack of of, of, of money uh, of rupee was, was there and for, for him to do everything just to ensure the operation is, is well done and then if we go further uh, next uh, slide please uh, we can see that terrorism financing is is, is is something which is so much of importance when we talk about this this kind of uh, operation, this kind of uh, successful uh, terrorist operation, because without money, uh, things will not go uh, any further. You have all the skills, you have the capacity, but then if you don't have the money to support all those things, uh, you will not go anywhere. So. By definition, terrorism, terrorism financing is about means and methods used by terrorist organizations to finance their activities. It comes from various sources. Uh, Firamala and Jia earlier said that you know, it all comes from uh, donation from uh, the sources here, one, two, three, four, and this the popular support is one of the things. One of the way they, they actually uh, get it, just like uh, this one. Uh, earlier this year, Yaku Rahman Lakwi, actually the financier of this uh, attack, was finally caught. Uh, but he was doing legal things. You know? He was doing legal activities, uh, selling medical uh, supplies and everything. It's not, nothing illegal about it. But the proceed of the money actually is just to do the, the, Ill the illegal activity of terrorism. So this is the thing that we should look at. You know, the sources uh, could be legal. Uh, could be comes at, uh, could be it could be coming from uh, activities is nobody actually is considering as, as illegal nothing is uh, like uh, just like on the on, on the right side the Muslim Dana Jama Islam Ya is a uh, just mentioned earlier by uh, Firamala uh, that you know these sources of Jama Islam in Indonesia uh, taken from Tempo uh, reported. Uh, uh, it is, it is very, very, you know, how can you say it's illegal? How can you stop it? How can you do those things and to stop those things without you know, understanding the flow, the proceed of money, where it goes? Uh, you cannot stop people selling good things, you know, selling uh, or say doing charity works and everything. You cannot do all those things because it doesn't, doesn't offend any law, doesn't break any law. So with 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 knowing with, without without knowing the 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 the, the you know, flow the illicit uh, the transfer of money from one place to others then we cannot understand this all, all this, this this situation i mean without having a better strategy to track uh, to uh, strengthen the mechanism to understand the money laundering also to counter terrorism just like in the FATF then uh, we will not be able to, you know, really prevent this this uh, this uh, this problem to continue. We understand that no two terrorist groups will have the same funding profile. You know, they will just keep on changing. If we, if if you read if you read the uh, the way the Jama Islamia is evolving in this report uh, uh, in these reports by uh, in fact reporting by the uh, Tembo, then you understand the way they shift from one strategy to others from you know charity from you know selling so-called uh, selling humanity uh, problems like selling about the issues of Syria for example selling about the issues of uh, Palestine or you just you know charity for anything you know in Indonesia you know people are so generous <laughs> and every if, if they are just given okay this is for the humanity they'll just go they just go they just give them the money without understanding uh, where it goes. Or we may say, uh, you know, every Friday prayer, you know, we there's also you know the the the, the boxes to, that circulated uh, during the sermons for us to, to give uh, to to just drop some money. But in India, you know, it's done after the prayer. This difference anyway. But then the, the way it is being done is, you know, nobody will, will suspect that it will go anywhere. 
we will go for it. Does it really go to the uh, 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 the charity, the, you, you, uh, the the good things that they are mentioning, or it just just like what happened here? The money done, uh, the money collected by Zaiku Rahman Lakvi was used to finance the uh, the attack in 2008. So it's it is it is it is something which is very necessary for next slide to, for us to actually to to could you go to next slide please yeah to look at the steps that we should do first of all i think very important yes uh you know the, the way the fatf was uh, established in 2003 it gives a, a very good a very very important attention on on the importance of anti money laundering laws and as well on the counter uh, countering uh, terrorist financing. With this instrument, actually, all the states uh, that are part of that uh, FATF or those the observers, like Indonesia, the observer of the FATF, is responsible to actually ensure that money, which is you know in and out, which is going in and out of, of Indonesia, for example, is really so clean money. It's not money that is uh illegally uh, sourced and illegally utilized uh but then you know it's always always uh always challenging if the money is not always uh, transferred uh in a, in a, in a, in a electronic way for example you know there is this hawala uh method in south in 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 in, in, in the subcontinent you know money is will is is, is, is is move uh, actually the money is transferred to one person to others, but then the exact movement is just within this country. So we cannot, you know, really understand or we cannot really, you know, see that this is really illegal. This is really something that we should look at, just like what happened uh, uh, in this uh, laundering of 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 money. So strengthening the anti-money laundering laws as well as strengthen the capacities of people within it. It will be very, very important st uh, steps to actually uh, you know, prevent this kind of uh, uh, illegal financing of terrorism. The second point is also, you know, harmonizing information formats at the national level, just like the case of of uh, Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, for example. You know, in India demanded it, but Pakistan didn't want to, to do all the, anything because you know they didn't accept. The, the 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 information or the evidence improving the evidence uh, acceptance of 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 exchange of court evidence you know it's also very important had for example uh, countries like india and pakistan at the time you know, agreed on these two aspects for example it, it it will not need you know uh more than 13 years to actually uh uh put zakir rahman lakvi in, in jail for example because everything is proven it's all there money is there, uh, the way he, he does uh, all those things are there, but then because of the non-standardized evidence collection uh, disagreement among the countries and also lack of use of technology to understand, you know, like now we have uh, this uh, so-called uh, cryptocurrency. It's also a way for us to, to look at. It's very important to understand how, you know, uh, the financing mechanism is being uh, change being transferred being improved all the way all along along the way and on the right side I, I i put a highlight on the international convention for the suppression of the financing of terrorism 150 more uh, 159 countries already you know signed it indonesia is part of it india is a part of it it is important actually to utilize this international mechanism in general too, just like if uh, in the corruption there's UNCAC, just to ensure collective works, collective uh, efforts to respond to this, uh, you know, uh, global menace. Just like I mentioned earlier, SDG 16.4, 16.4 is mentioning about you know reduction of this illicit financial flow, including the uh, terrorist financing. So if we can use these uh, steps, uh, we can. Uh, somehow prevent uh, the potential uh, occurrence of this kind of uh, 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 terrorist attack anywhere in the world in the future. And last one, I mean, prevent, reduce criminal threats. One of the ways to, to get uh, into this uh, point is about, uh, you know, instilling understanding of, you know, being uh, 
uh, a part of humanity which is plural, being Muslims. It's already written in Quran that all of us, and we, we live in a in a diverse uh, situation. We are created diverse. We should respect all these all these things. And I, before this uh, webinar, actually, when I was in the, the 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 Friday prayer, it was a very good message by the in, in the sermon say like. Uh, moderation in you know in, in, in religion is part one of the ways to prevent you know, uh, uh, terrorism but there's something else not uh, not about financing but again the importance of having this kind of steps regulation and everything is is key for all of us for all the countries all the parties actually to respond to prevent and to uh, avoid the repeat of this uh, 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 incidents in Mumbai. Uh, in closing, uh, for me, uh, let's just have a minute of, uh, uh, of silence for the, all those victims so that they they, are, they they can rest in peace and and, and hopefully things are uh, will be better in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmad Kisai. Very interesting uh, view, and I think uh, you, your excellence presentation, even though very short but comprehensive, uh, put uh, touch in uh, in line with our goals of a seminar today is uh, raise awareness about the dangers of ter terrorism and state sponsored terrorism, and. Uh, of course, the uh, financing uh, terrorist act is one of the complicated, yeah, uh, complicated process and very, very hard to prevent to some extent. Uh, so this is we, we can we have a lot of discussion after uh, the fourth uh, uh, distinguished speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Um, Anton uh, Ali Abbas. Uh, please uh, give me time to um, explaining and. Uh, introduce you to the audience uh, because we are uh, streaming uh, live in YouTube. So, 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 so this is a new generation, Mr. Atta Hasnan. Uh, YouTube streaming is one much more important uh, to connect, uh, you know, the worlds. Uh, Mr. Atta is uh, in New Delhi, but we are in Jakarta, in Indonesia. So this is uh, a great uh, discussion uh, about uh, from the great uh, thinker, great scholars. Uh, Mr. Ali Abbas, uh, PhD, uh, basically uh, alumni of uh, uh, Cranfield University, fresh graduate, I guess, <laughs> PhD uh, 2019 in defense and security. So if you look at the uh, 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 CV of uh, next speaker is uh, very young, yeah? promising a scholar for the future. Uh, 2020 now is the member of expert panel of maritime security index indonesia coast guard so this is a very uh, uh, very new and important institution uh, deal with the maritime in indonesia and in 2022 until now uh, head of center for intermestic and diplomatic engagement or side research based consulting firm. So this is very, uh, very much uh, with the international and defense. Uh, also, uh, guest reviewer for security and defense quarterly journal and international social science. Indeed, this is a very important journal, I guess. Uh, and then also he is a guest reviewer for political publication from director of production accounts uh, statistic uh, Indonesia. This is intersection a very important Indonesia to collect the data and to present uh, latest development economic and political uh, fields. And also uh, a lecturer Paramadina Graduate School of Diplomacy, Paramadina University in Jakarta. And uh, very, uh, very interesting, uh, Mr. Anton Ali Albas, a occasional lecturer for the Master of Science in Counterterrorism, Cranfield Forensic Institute. Uh, Cranfield University in UK. Please welcome uh, for Anton Ali Abbas to present your uh, perspective on uh, today's topics. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bang uh, um, Asep. Good afternoon. Uh, it's been an honor for me uh, to participate uh, 
this event to commemorate uh, the tragic uh, Mumbai attack that happened 13 years ago. Uh, I remember when I was uh, attending a program on terrorism and security studies in Germany, I met a former India Army Chief of Staff, uh, General Retired uh, Vijay Kumar Singh. Uh, I think uh, that was two months after he retired as a uh, chief of army. Uh, we discussed uh, regarding uh, the Mumbai attack. Uh, then since, since then, I, I, I frequently uh, brought the Mumbai case into my terrorism class. Uh, we watched the BBC documentary on, on the event together with students. And after that, we discussed the case. In short, for me, uh, the, the attack uh, was unique and uh, one of the, the exceptional uh, terrorist events as we could easily observe the complexity of terrorist, uh, terrorism phenomenon. As uh, three speakers uh, earlier have discussed regarding the event, I think in the next 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I would try to make a link the event with uh, terrorism in Indonesia, whether uh, the Mumbai attack uh, have affected the terrorist attack in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, talking about the Mumbai attack, I would try to, to, to illustrate the novelty uh, of Mumbai event in five points. First, of course, uh, as uh, General Hasnain uh, explained, uh, the overwhelming uh, firepower. Uh, as we can see, the terrorists came uh, heavily armed, uh, each uh, carried an uh, automatic assault rifle with magazine of ammunition. Uh, the terrorists also used machine gun, uh, armed with pistol, hand grenades, and also had IEDs. Second, uh, remote control uh, navigation, we can uh, see uh, during the event, at least there was um, almost 60,000 seconds uh, phone contact uh, between the attacker and the, the handler. The attack uh, was obviously uh, being directed in real time from Karachi through uh, mobile and internet uh, telephone. Uh, this digital uh, trail connecting uh, the attackers in Mumbai with the handler uh, with with their handler in Karachi. Uh, the third uh, point uh, is duration and uh, lethal, uh, lethality. Uh, the terrorists uh, led siege uh, to Mumbai over a period of three days. Uh, they met uh, Taj Mahal place, uh, palace in uh, palace hotel in flames, attacked the Obrey Hotel, uh, railway station, uh, Leopold Cafe, uh, and the Chabad House. Those attacks killed uh, at least 160 uh, people. Regarding the, the media aspect, uh, since the Mumbai attack, we could see also how social media has become one of most powerful tool in disseminating information and shaping uh, opinion across the world. Just a day after the siege of Mumbai began, uh, we can see uh, Twitter users not only broke the news first, uh, but also continued to provide invaluable stream of information. Hashtag of Mumbai, uh, was trending uh, and it made easier, of course, uh, for families and journalists to get information of what was uh, happening on the street, on the train station, inside building and hotels under attack. Uh, we also can see a 24 hour uh, news television camera were trained uh, on each location. And also, um, intercept of uh, phone calls between attackers and their handlers indicated that they were watching the news all in uh, real time. The last point uh, regarding the novelty of Mumbai uh, is the new fashion of uh, terrorist attack. 
We can see uh, marauding uh, tactics were applied in several attacks across the globe. Uh, one of the occasion uh, following the Mumbai uh, was Westgate Mall attack in Nairobi, Kenya in 2013 and also Paris in 2015. Uh, in particular, in, in Nairobi attack, uh, the, the attacker admitted they learned uh, from Mumbai. Next, please. Uh, regarding the, when we talk about the Indonesia, at least uh, there are three forms of terrorism in Indonesia versus uh, foreign fighter. According to the data, more than 1,400 uh, Indonesian has joined uh, the ISIL in Syria. Uh, this number, of course, exclude uh, they are who deported from Turkey before entering Syria. Uh, and in 2020, uh, at least the returnees uh, has reached uh, 800 people. The second form is home ground terrorism. The active groups are uh, Mujahid in Nisha Timur, operates in Central Sulawesi, Jamaan Saru Tauhid, uh, both of them affiliated to ISIS, uh, ISIS and uh, Neo Jamaah Islamiyah, uh, as uh, Dr. Kisai uh, mentioned who was affiliated to Al-Qaeda during the period uh, of 2000 to 2015, at least 1,100 persons have been prosecuted uh, in, term, in, in various uh, terrorism cases. And the last one is, this is the emerging uh, uh, phenomenon uh, was uh, the lone wolf terrorism. For this, uh, we do not, no, uh, the exact number, uh, how many uh, lone wolf terrorism uh, operates in Indonesia. Next. How about connection? It is clear that home ground terrorism has a uh, connection with the global terrorist group. As I mentioned before, um, Mujahid Indonesia Timur uh, and Jaman Saru Tauhid, for instance, uh, have a clear link to ISIS while neo jamaah Islamia links to Al-Qaeda. However, it is unclear to reveal the direct connection between lone wolf terrorism with the global and home ground terrorist group. But as both home ground and global terrorist groups provide abundance of information and propaganda through internet and this method works for lone wolf terrorism. Uh, even though sometimes cases of a lone wolf are unique, uh, thus in several cases, the process of radicalization is through internet or, or online method without uh, need to know who is the imam and so on. In this regard, uh, tracing the lone wolf is uh, very hard at the moment as they don't have any direct connection to existing terrorist group. Next, please. Referring to global terrorism uh, database, the number of uh, terrorist attack in Indonesia and their casualties increased significantly since uh, reform era in 2000, uh, in, in 1998. However, as uh, government applied hard and soft approach in dealing with terrorists, the vigor uh, was uh, substantially uh, decreased. But still, we can, we can see some uh, partial achievement. In Jama Islamia case, uh, government, uh, for instance, uh, used hard approach, decapitation and repression. The approach relatively successful in dismantling the terrorist network. Meanwhile, dealing with the separatism, uh, government apply a soft approach. There was a peace negotiation to end Aceh separatism and referendum uh, for East Timor that those uh, approach can end uh, the violence. Next slide, please. But if we compare uh, the data before and after a Mumbai attack, we can see at least largely uh, both pre and post Mumbai attack, 
uh, terrorist in Indonesia uh, mostly uh, was unknown. It means uh, we cannot easily identify and verify the attackers. Uh, but the religious base group uh, was still becoming a major actor in shaking uh, Indonesian uh, national security. And also regarding the separatism issue, we can see the actor also was changing. Uh, Papua separatism uh, post Mumbai attack uh, has replaced uh, free Aceh movement as the Helsinki uh, peace uh, agreement uh, and ended the, 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 the conflict since uh, 2005. Next, how about terrorist target? That we can see post Mumbai uh, attack, uh, police and military uh, have become the target of, uh, of, of the terrorist attack. We can see the number of uh, attack were increased significantly compared to the pre Mumbai attack. This can be mean that a perpetrator uh, was intended to apply targeted rather than indiscriminate attack. In many equations, uh, religious uh, based terrorist group openly encourage their follower, their supporter to attack police uh, or military uh, station as they portray uh, the police and military as Ansar Togut or anti-Islamic oppressors. Next, uh, regarding the types of weapon, uh, terrorist group uh, still prefer to use explosive devices and firearms for both pre and post Mumbai attack. Uh, number of using Molotov cocktails as uh, incendiary also increased significantly. Uh, it's probably uh, used by the the, uh, the terrorist group. Next. Back to the, the my, my, my central question, whether um, Mumbai attack significantly inspired terrorist attack in Indonesia. My temporary uh, conclusion is no. Indeed, a number of armed assault uh, was increased, but according to the global terrorism da uh, database, uh, the assault was part of applying uh, guerrilla or hit and run tactics rather than uh, marauding style. As we can see in, in Poso, Central Sulawesi, for instance, Indonesia's uh, security apparatus have been fighting uh, a guerrilla uh, warfare with a radical group uh, for years. Uh, several small scale attack uh, seems uh, were not intending to cause extreme damage compared to uh, Mumbai attack. Next, still uh, we can see some uh, relative uh, commonalities uh, between terrorist threat in Indonesia and India. First, we can argue that uh, both in Indonesia and India, the nature uh, of terrorist groups have transnational uh, dimension, even though of course, so when we are going to the detail of the groups, uh, they are completely different. Laskar at Taiba or uh, Jam uh, in India uh, can be categorized as a state-sponsored terrorist group. And of course, they are different uh, with the Jamaat Islamia or Jamaat Saru Tauhid in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, second, the existence of uh, terrorist military uh, like time, uh, both terrorist group in India and Indonesia, uh, underline the need of uh, training camp. Mumbai was uh, the obvious case for how the attackers uh, have three months uh, trained outside India. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, uh, in earlier this year, Indonesian police uncovered a compilation video allegedly showing an elite force of uh, Jamaat Islamia members engaged in military-like training. 
as well as uh, kidnapping simulation between 2013 uh, and 2018. According to Indonesian police, uh, the members were between uh, 19 to 23 years old and received uh, seven months in, uh, in training before being sent uh, to fight uh, in Syria. The terrorist uh, training camp uh, were run in, uh, according to the police, in, in 12 locations in India and in Indonesia and involved uh, seven different groups comprised of up to 15 uh, recruits. Indeed, uh, talking about the marauding style, uh, the Sarina uh, attack in 2000. 16 uh, might be classified as marauding uh, terrorist firearm attack that is applied in uh, several terrorist attacks such as Mumbai 2008, uh, Nairobi 2013, and Paris 2015. In this modus operandi, uh, the offenders uh, may conduct a simultaneous attack in multiple locations by de uh, deliberately using combination of uh, explosion and firearms. This attack may also uh, include the taking of hostage uh, and likely targeting busy place, a shopping center, public transportation in order to gain maximum impact and cause panic. Also, the Sarina attack indicated that the, the, the terrorist group was trying to imitate and learn uh, from other terrorist attacks. The attackers uh, armed with small arms uh, and only brought light uh, explosive uh, devices. They uh, conducted the assault more overt overtly uh, than a previous attack uh, in the last decade. However, uh, the sudden attackers did not seem uh, for me to achieve maximum casualties rather than uh, just only showing uh, their presence or uh, exercising new tactic. The terrorist group uh, was only likely to, to attack police officers and uh, assault Western icons. At that time, uh, Starbucks uh, coffee shop and uh, foreigners as the, the event occurred in, 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 the, in the busy streets in the middle of uh, Jakarta. The attackers, uh, for me, have missed opportunity to create more casualties when the crowd of people was surrounding them. Meanwhile, compared to Paris attack, for instance, uh, the assault did indiscriminate attack in order to gain uh, extreme damage. Regarding the simultaneous attack, Indonesia also ever faced uh, Ritz Carlton and JW Merritt bombing in, in 2009 that the perpetrators uh, launched attacks in two different uh, places uh, simultaneously. Will uh, marauding style be a future threat for Indonesia? Reflecting uh, to, to, to Sarina case, a uh, marauding attack uh, is possible uh, to be adopted uh, by terrorist group in Indonesia as the style has uh, at least uh, two advantages. First, the cost of marauding is relatively cheaper than a car bombing. Uh, on the other hand, as uh, Dr. Kisai uh, elaborate, uh, the terrorist financing sources uh, currently are more varied and advanced. Second, uh, the attackers uh, are even harder uh, to be identified than a car bomber, as we currently uh, face uh, the emerging of family bomber and lone wolf terrorism. Uh, the marauding style uh, may easily fit with the emerging threat. But of course, hopefully, knock knock on the wood, uh, we will not face uh, this such terrorist attack uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anton Aliabas. I just want to remind to the audience on YouTube streaming and also uh, for us that we are 
uh, the seminar uh, uh, conducted by uh, GCS. Uh, thank you, GCS, GCS Center for Southeast Asian Studies, uh, who um, uh, conduct with this seminar. The, the, the topic is commemorating the tragedy of uh, 26th of November, Mumbai terror attacks. So this terror attack is uh, did it uh, 30, uh, 13 years ago. Uh, now time for discussion. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, some question uh, for discuss uh, today. Uh, and indeed, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for all excellent uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, Mumbai is not an uh, on dispute uh, or conflict zones, of course. Uh, why did terrorism uh, terrorists from the neighbor country Pakistan target Mumbai? So I think uh, Mr. Atta um, will answer this question uh, very much uh, in, uh, in detail. Uh, why? This is the, the, the very much uh, important question because the targeted of a terrorist uh, actor sometimes then is a surprise, uh, you know, the peoples uh, in the world. Please, uh, Mr. Uh, Atta. Uh, thank you for the question, but... Uh... The first part of the question was not very clear to me. Can you just tell me the first part of the question? Yeah, uh, Mumbai is not a, a conflict zone, basically. Okay, okay, okay. Why, why did why did they targeted right. Mumbai? Right, right. Thank you very much. That's a very it's, it's a it's an expected question and a delightful question to respond to. Uh, in modern warfare, you see, this is not conventional warfare. Mm -hmm. Your idea is the way you have put it across. You are looking at this whole thing as from a conventional angle. Conventional warfare means conflict zones. And in conflict zone, and then you look at the application of forces, etc. Now, in fourth generation warfare, fifth generation warfare, where there's connectivity around the world, connectivity around the country, the impact of something happening in one remote part of the country or the world can have a major devastating effect. And the effect which was expected, first of all, as I explained to you, the environment of South Asia between India and Pakistan. I'm the former commander of the Indian Army in Kashmir, right? I commanded the Indian Army in Kashmir. So I can tell you this, that uh, I can also share with you that uh, seven days before 2611, I was one of the commanders, uh, subordinate commanders in Kashmir at that time. We killed seven terrorists who had infiltrated inside. Their action later on, we surmised, their action was that they would attack one of the towns in North Kashmir simultaneously while the events were going on in Mumbai. So it would look as if, you know, the connect, the connect. see, this is something happening in Kashmir, this is something happening in Mumbai. This whole issue is connected to the rest of India. This was to give it a larger kind of issue. But we killed those seven set terrorists, so it never, it never happened. Secondly, I already explained that we had undergone an attack in Delhi a number of times. And in Delhi, we had a huge attack on 13th of December 2001 on the Parliament of India. Can you imagine the, the seat of democracy? That's where it was effective. So it was a psychological hit on the people of India. We can reach you anywhere. That's the kind of terrorist message which was being sent out. We can just reach you anywhere, anywhere. Your government, your legislature, your judiciary, your army, your police, we can hit you anywhere. And this is the kind of messaging which normal terrorists do. Mumbai is a very, very important part of it. As already brought out in, in our presentations, Mumbai is the financial capital of India, and it's also the entertainment capital. Very, very good observation by our speakers. I did not say it, but it's very, very correct. Bollywood, Bollywood has got a, uh, you know, iconic kind of image around the world, the song and dance from, which comes out from here, from there. And much of India looks at Mumbai, much of India loves to go to Mumbai, most people who are 17, 18 years old want have got the ambition to go and become an actor, an actress, or something or the other in, in Mumbai. So Mumbai is there in the minds of the people. Now you got to remember that this modern warfare today is about minds. It's as much about causing casualties, physically disabling elements, but at the same time, the mind. And hitting hitting Mumbai meant hitting the mind of India. See, we have reached your financial capital. We have reached your, your uh, entertainment capital. Where will you hide? That's the kind of message. But we neutralized it. We neutralized it effectively. Up, but we lost a lot of people, 165 people. It traumatized. It traumatized our society. It was, it was a very, very bad action. But India 
one thing which mumbai proved was that it's a very resilient city there was no response there was no reaction otherwise you are you know we are a diverse country we have different form people we have different religions and one set of people can blame the other set of people that's all the, the intention of the sponsor state to try and bring about dissension among the people try and bring about riots among the people none of this happened there were peace marches all over mumbai and that's how mumbai overcame this whole problem thank you for that question thank you mr atta hasnain uh, very much uh, very clear uh, this is uh, why the mumbai is uh, targeted for a terror uh, attack and because this is uh, a very important city and the heart of uh, uh, entertainment and finance <laughs> in same way so this is a uh, very 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 good uh, answer uh, mr feramala do you want to add or mr anton uh, what uh, the, the first question we have uh, still uh, 20 minutes uh, to discuss yeah, yeah. Uh, please uh, yeah thank you thank you very much for sir uh, it is a very good uh, question actually we must see uh, the background the background because this is something to do with the rivalry or enmity between india and pakistan because both were one country under british rule then they separated on the basis of the religion and then the pakistan wanted to uh, have a uh, uh, take over this jammu and kashmir but uh, the uh, ruler legally acceded to india uh, uh, that pakistan didn't like since then pakistan has been trying every trick in the book to uh, create problems uh, for india for example it went war in 1947 1965 1971 1999 but in all these wars it lost and it uh, suffered a humiliation then in uh, i think in the 1989 onwards it changed its policy so it's uh, it uh, started a proxy war using non state actors like uh, religious groups like uh, terror groups separatist movements so this is the background actually so that's why it has a policy of bleeding india by a thousand cuts that is the strategy so as that part of that strategy this uh, through its uh, spy agency isi which gave money which gave money around 28000 dollars to an american pakistani to take uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, videos uh, uh, maps photos of these targeted attacks so uh, they funded it they funded it and then all these uh, witnesses uh, they they uh, admitted confessed that the pakistan isi played a big role uh, but their main motive is to damage the image of india to inflict uh, casualties and uh, also uh, in this mumbai attacks there is a new thing because they didn't target only indians they deliberately targeted foreigners so see we have 26 victims of from 16 Uh, countries so that it will get a huge media coverage in the world then also the, they try to avoid uh, their identities that we will uh, discuss later yeah thank you that is my answer thank you for feramala do you think mr ahmad K uh, kisai can answer this uh, mumbai is uh, uh, to become the great attention of the world what the, this terrorist attack so this city is uh, the target of the terrorists pak ahmad kisai Yeah, it's uh, you know, I always remember uh, East or West India is the best. That's one of the term that I used to heard when I was in India. Oh, right. uh, you know, <laughs> uh, Mumbai is the capital of everything. I can say. I mean, uh, we look at the India. Mumbai is the capital of everything. We have Bollywood. We have uh, you know, uh, the 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 uh, stock exchange. We have everything. There. If And only if those things are crippled, then what would happen to India? I think this was a clear message that was sent uh, during the uh, 2008 uh, attack, and we understood during those days India actually was growing. We should remember that India was shining at this time, back in you know uh, in 2005 and and forward. You know it was really really emerging economy, and Mumbai is the engine of it. what how 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 would how would how, how, i mean like 
if this, you know, the engine is shut off, what would happen to India? So I think this very, very important message was sent out part of those, uh, you know, other messages of, uh, you know, uh, say, could be a rifle between like the country and everything. But then looking from the perspective, I think uh, targeting by, is, uh, you know, nobody actually was, was, was uh, actually uh, 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 really look at, at that, uh, you know, aspect. But then considering the, 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 gra- the, the gravity, the potent gravity that could be inflicted to the uh, finance capital of India, and uh, you just, you know, I mean, this is this is the point I I, can, I I would like to, to share on this aspect because yes, back in the nineties we have the the uh, uh, general Atta Hassan Sab already mentioned about you know the effect of uh, Babri Mosque demolition in nine in nineteen ninety two. It's just just you know if you if you are a, 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 a fan of of Sanjay Dutt, then you understand what happened to him at that time. So uh, it is not. Exactly, a uh, uh, conflict-free zone area. Uh, we can we can we can say that it is not a conflict-free uh, zone, but then there is there's always you know um, not exactly a melting pot of uh, different uh, people, different uh, uh, individuals from all over India. The competition which is there is not exactly melting in the sense like Mumbai dream or anything. But then having Mumbai. The capital of uh, uh, the capital of, of India uh, being uh, humiliated, then you can humiliate India's growing, uh, you know, presence. So I think this is a clear message that was being sent uh, to this terrorist attack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anton. Can you add some something? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pasef. Uh, First, for me, uh, uh, bear in mind that terrorist group, of course, never launch. Uh, attack uh, without preparation. Uh, uh, of course, they, they, that's why uh, for uh, each attack, they always have uh, like a precipitation. And uh, for me, why Mumbai? Mumbai, of course, uh, is a big city in India. And Laskar et Toiba, uh, of course, perceive India, the greater India, as a war zone. So. Uh, Mumbai for me uh, meet the requirement for the, the terrorist target and all, of course also that uh, terrorists uh, maybe rarely attack the quiet city or small city so uh, the, the Mumbai is a big city as uh, Lieutenant uh, General Hasnan mentioned before so the, it's the big city of course it may attract easily the world attention and for me why they, they also uh, try to attack Mumbai uh, for me. Uh, the Laskar et Toiba also try to, to exercise the uh, marauding uh, tactic, uh, tactics. They, they, they're new. They, they want to apply new tactics to deliver a uh, terrorist attack. Bring light weapons, grenades, IEDs with casual clothes. Then so we, we, it's, it's hard to know which one is the, the attackers. And, of, and also uh, the handler uh, completely uh, know how to gain uh, media attention. When I watch the, the, the BBC documentary, for instance, uh, they, they, they call, burn the curtain, Taj Mahal, then the camera will go to yours. So uh, they, they know uh, what will happen if we do this, do this. And even by, by the end, the controller said, this is only the trailer. We will have another. So for me, uh, it's something like uh, they're trying to exercise uh, and new, uh, new terrorist uh, tax, tactics. Then they, they, for me, they successfully uh, deliver uh, the attacks to get some uh, political objectives. Thank you. Thank you. This is, uh, we are going to the end of uh, our uh, international seminar. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, request to the uh, speakers to have a, um, a closing statement, a conclusion of our seminar today. It's very exciting. We do have uh, four distinguished speaker from New Delhi and Jakarta. And then uh, please, uh, Lieutenant General, retire at the Hasnay who have a 
closing statement. I suppose uh, two minutes. Two minutes would be the ideal amount of time. Uh, I take something out of what was spoken by my colleagues on the panel. All of them are brilliant uh, presentations. Uh, one of the issues I pick up is the media aspect. I think it was uh, made by Anton Ali Abbasa. Uh, mm. it, in fact, the me aspect of media came out starkly clear in this particular incident. We were immature in the handling of media. We didn't know, um, you know, we are a democratic society and we feel that anything and everything which is happening must be reported in real time uh, to the people. So we permitted media to go there and media was you know, hounding all over the place. They had their cameras framed right on top of there and little did we realize, very correctly pointed out by Anthony, that, that uh, there were handlers there, probably they anticipated it. The handlers were sitting there. They knew the Indian media will start doing this kind of a thing. The Indian media got into this aspect of commenting, com bringing in people to do commentary on it. What is likely to happen next? What can happen possibly? And everyone was listening, and the whole thing was live in front. The scenario was there, where our National Security Guard is going, where is it getting deployed, how is it doing its operations, the helicopter is now coming, it's now coming onto the roof of the hotel, everything was there. Otherwise, this information would not have been there available to the handlers, and the handlers could not have in real time been guiding the terrorists right inside. So this is a major lesson learned. Media can always be kept away. Media should be kept on a periphery. And uh, media's hunger for news must be satisfied by having a media center immediately established in the vicinity, which means one kilometer away. It can be there. And a, a, a person who is uh, who's authorized should be able to come there and give all the news authentically, officially to the media to satisfy them. Otherwise, if you don't do this, the media will go hounding you everywhere. And there, after all, the first story is the most important story, and that's what the media always does. So this was a major, major lesson for us. Since then, we have made sure that the um, media does not come anywhere near these sites. We have we have got these incidents taking place in Kashmir most of the time. No, not on such a huge scale, but on a smaller scale, where four or five terrorists are killed. We make sure we keep, we create these small media centers wherever such an operation is going on, but well away from the site of the encounter. I think I, I will stop there. That's a no small intervention, which I thought. But I think this seminar was much called for because we cannot allow us, ourselves to forget this. Uh, I would say we, the, the real worth of our understanding will be when we take the cascading effects of uh, 26, uh, 11, 26 November. What has happened since then? But this was really the cue for large-scale terrorist acts. Now, today, we are in the world of fifth generation of warfare which is non-kinetic, mostly on against the mind, psychological operations. Uh, we didn't hear in this seminar because uh, this was not uh, the focus here. I would love to hear from Indonesian uh, experts many times. I would love to hear sometime in the future. How do you look at fifth generation warfare? Are you being affected by social media? How are you being affected by social media? The negativity which is emerged in India will hugely, hugely affected. Right? The negativity, how, is, how are your enemies trying to create dissensions in your own society and things like that? And how do you intend to counter on this in the future? Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Atahas Nain. And please, uh, next, uh, Peramala Anjaya to have a, a closing statement. Yeah, thank you, Pasek. Thank you. Uh, I only worry about the victims and their families, victims and their families. 13 years have already passed. Still, the perpetrators, the masterminds are still roaming free in Pakistan because even uh, we have uh, so many names, like from the Lashkari Doiba, of course, that the terrorist organization there, we have the names. And we have also from the uh, Major Iqbal from the ISI. Major Abdul Rahman Pasha and Major Samir Ali and Colonel Pasha. There are so many people directly involved, but there was no action uh, on both sides, from the terrorist side and this side. The Pakistan promised to take action, but India believed it, unfortunately. But until this day, it never happened. Even recently in September, uh, uh, US President Joe Biden and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi 
they both agreed that uh, there should we should not uh, tolerate cross border terrorism here the terrorism is nothing to do with the religion so it is it is a, uh, some state agency sponsored uh, terrorists they are coming into india and they launching attacks killing innocent people so that's why we should have a mechanism at the united nations security council or world community we should pinpoint that this is not good we should take action if every time if terrorists launch an attack there should be they should be brought to the justice so in this case it didn't happen even they did to show to the world pakistan did they arrest said sami and then after 2 3 weeks they released it and uh, the the case has cases has been going on long time deliberately they are uh, changing the judges postponing the cases so this is not a, a good sign from uh, pakistan uh, so uh, we should uh, world community must be on alert and must uh, demand that the all the masterminds of mumbai terror attacks must be brought to the justice thank you pastor very much uh, good point from feramala in this conclusion so chase the masterminds yeah and don't yeah, do yeah. not stop like that yeah uh, mr ahmad kisai have a some word to close uh, our seminar thank you kang asep uh, it's been uh, enlightening uh, you know moments for me uh, re- just reminding me back my days in india and you know, things everything it just, just shocked me that, that that 2008 was shocking really shocking but then i'll just go back to the uh, uh, point that you know uh, opening a laundry service is a good business you know <laughs> in places like uh, like in indonesia when i was in also in india opening a laundry service is, is good business you know it helps for everyone uh, in a good shape you know i mean uh, you can uh, get good money or everything but then doing money laundering is something else so i mean uh, good laundry service will give uh, better uh, uh, lives to humanities but then money laundering is exactly the opposite you do the do you launder the dirty money just to just to look at you know, look at that make it as if it is it is it's good it is uh, it is uh, uh, i mean legal but then next to it is not and if we cannot counter this you know manage the money laundering is a lot of aspect that can be done actually a lot of studies have been done you know, uh, to prevent the placement layering and uh, integration but then it needs more than two i'm like it, they, they said they said it needs two to tango but then as a humanity as a, as a as as we live in this a globalized world as the sdgs has mentioned you know it's a global effort between all the you know, as, uh, all the actors state non state actors like to collaborate even the private sector to collaborate on these things we understand that the gatekeepers are uh, the responsible uh, individuals who are uh, who, ha- who should actually uh, be at the front line to prevent all this kind of uh, 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 laundering happened but then often time they are part of it and if we just don't stick to the uh, 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 common goals of you know preventing uh, and and uh, eradicating issues of terrorism then we cannot go further SDGs is important aspect. 16.4 is 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 we have agreed. Uh, you know, countries in the world has agreed that uh, it is an important aspect in preventing uh, prevention of uh, uh, money laundering and prevention of illicit funds flow. So let's go for it. Wallahu mafikulak madariq. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmad. Uh, the last uh, closing statement from Anton. Mr. Anton, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Kang Asep. For me, as we live in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it, it is clear that the, the pandemic uh, cannot stop uh, the phenomenon of uh, terrorism. Uh, even uh, the, 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 the pandemic uh, uh, add to the complexity of the phenomenon. Thus, as uh, Maskisai mentioned, without, uh, without an improvement of national regional and global effort in combating uh, transnational uh, terrorism uh, for me uh, any country then uh, should aware and even worry uh, with uh, the mumbai attack uh, 
style, style as it is easy to copy, uh, but it's harder to detect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anton Ali Abbas. Uh, it is an uh, honor for me to have uh, to be a moderator uh, for uh, two alumni of India <laughs> University <laughs> and three alumni of UK, including me. <laughs> so this is a very, very much interesting and lively discussion. Uh, hopefully, uh, on behalf of uh, CCS uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies, I would like to thank to distinguished uh, four distinguished speakers and also the audience uh, through the streaming of YouTube uh, keep uh, uh, with, with us uh, with the topic of commemorating the tragedy of uh, 26 November Mumbai terror attacks. We hope uh, have uh, insight and also broadening our uh, understanding uh, how could we prevent uh, the next uh, uh, tragedy, uh, particularly uh, terror attacks uh, in our country and in the world. So again, thank you very much. Um, um, my name is Asep Setiawan from University of Muhammadiyah Jakarta. Again, thank you to four distinguished speaker from New Delhi, Mr. General, uh, Lieutenant General Atta Hasnainen and Ramala Anjaya from Jakarta, Mr. Anton Ali Abbas and Ahmad Kisai. Thank you very much. I wish we, we can uh, meet again in the next uh, seminar and goodbye. Thank you very much and all the thank best you. for you. Thank you. Allah Hafiz. Allah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Viramala. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mantan. Thank you, Kang Asep. See you, Ali. See you there. Okay. See you there. Bye. Bye.